My name is Anne Helmreich, and I'm the director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities. Um, and on behalf of the center, my associate director, Mary Davis, and the Center for Interdisciplinary Programs here at CWRU, I welcome you to the first in our series of public lectures on the topic of cityscapes. Um, I'm a teacher, so I want to begin with some housekeeping. <laughs> Can you all either turn off or otherwise silence your cell phones? Also, um, probably many of you received a comment card on your way in. We would really appreciate hearing some feedback from you about this event, um, particularly things we can control as opposed to parking. And um, please give those to the staff members you'll see on the way out. Also, if you haven't received it, we have a flyer listing the upcoming lectures in our series. The past, present, and future of the city has been a frequent topic of discussion here in Cleveland, and our desire in the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities is to reveal what the arts and humanities can bring to this conversation. And I should mention, I know we're not alone in this. Um, later on this evening at the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State, they'll be opening an exhibition on a photography exhibition called Envisioning Cleveland, so you can go straight from here to there. Here at Baker Nord, our attention this fall has been on a faculty seminar on cityscapes, and we've had the great pleasure of welcoming Dr. Robert Brugman as a short-term visiting fellow to our seminar, and we've been having some great fun. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Brugman this evening as our inaugural speaker in our lecture series on cityscapes. And Bob has arguably earned his um, expertise in urbanism from both life experience and education. He grew up outside of Pittsburgh, attended graduate school in Philadelphia, and has lived in Chicago for the last 30 years. Indeed, he's written extensively about Chicago architecture, and his catalog with the firm of Hollabird and Roosh, published in 1991, won the Spiro Kostoff Book Award for its contribution to our understanding of the physical environment. He's contributed to exhibitions about Chicago architecture and city plans, worked with Peter Hales in creating the Chicago image-based um, image project and interactive website, and has also assisted, assisted the City Design Center um, in Chicago and the historic Gr Chicago Greystone Initiative in revitalizing a neighborhood of North Lawndale um, in Chicago. It's an admirable ex example of a public, as an academic, as public intellectual, making a difference in the life of the community. But despite his wealth of knowledge about Chicago, it's not the image of the Windy City that Dr. Brugman leaves us with in the closing chapter of his latest book, Sprawl, A Compact History. It's Los Angeles, LA glimpsed out of a plane window, a city that refuses to be framed by the portal of a plane. In Bob's evocative prose, and I'll quote here, Marking off a vast grid are the great arterial highways with a regular punctuation of yellowish sodium vapor lamps in the pools of colored light created by electric store signs at the major intersections. Snaking across the arterials are the dark linear voids of the riverbeds and the brightly lit freeways with their shimmering ribbon of white headlights and red taillights. It is a landscape that is both so familiar and so strange, one that we know well and one we still don't fully understand. The great contribution of the book Sprawl is to give us a history of this phenomenon, and through this chronicling, a means to comprehend, contemplate, measure, and assess. It's a topic rife with thorny thickets. I imagine most of you in the room have an opinion about Sprawl even before the lecture has begun. And the anxiety surrounding Sprawl has been both pronounced and longstanding. To prove my point, Here's a short excerpt from Life Magazine, published one year before our speaker graduated high school. I won't tell you when that was. <laughs> Swiftly, the great cities swallowing are swallowing Americans. Even as the population expands, the lovely land is losing people. These cities grow like living cells and finally join up and become megapolis, unbroken for hundreds of miles." End quote. Bob Brugman is perhaps the best person to guide us through these thorny thickets and address our anxieties squarely. Alex Krieger, writing for the Harvard Design Magazine, describes Sprawl, a compact history, as meticulously researched and ambitious in historic scope. I am grateful for that ambitious scope, for it brings us to Bob's topic today, Cleveland and Sprawl, a global perspective. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Brugman. Thank you very much, Anne, for that um, elegant introduction. 
I'm always pleased to come to Cleveland. I, one of the things that's interesting to me about it is that it's so much in many ways like Chicago, um, that is an industrial city that grew at a certain time and then had problems because of the very fast growth and the particular kinds of industry that it um, attracted. Um, actually, I've changed the title of this a little bit to um, Northeast Ohio and Sprawl because that's really the, the economic unit that we're talking about. But before I um, talk about Northeast Ohio, let me just uh, give you a few words about the book itself. Um, the origin of this book um, might seem paradoxical, was not um, really American cities at all. It was when I was doing my dissertation on late 18th and early 19th century Paris. At that time, one of the experiences that I frequently had was to go from central Paris, where I was living, to the airport down at that time at Orly. And when I did that, the landscape that I saw was the kind of landscape you see here. And I would see a very much the same landscape when I came back down in Toronto or Cincinnati or Cleveland. Um, I thought, well, I, I don't really know much about this. Maybe I can go to the library and do some reading. And what I found in the library was shelf after shelf of books on central cities, on central Paris, central Chicago, central London, and almost nothing on these places where already in, in the 1970s the vast majority of urbanites lived. And I guess my, my really naive initial question was, why is it that these places which are the, the home of the majority of urban dwellers are so of so little interest to so many people? So I started a, um, a project then that was going to be simply about the decentralization of cities, how cities had sprawled outward over the years. Um, and um, in the middle of doing that in the 1980s, I was really startled to find out that there was this huge hue and cry about sprawl. And um, I, was, I knew the word, it wasn't new to me, but it, it suddenly became on everyone's tongue. And um, they had a whole series of arguments about why it was bad. And as I started to look at these, even 10 minutes reflection seemed to suggest that most of what I was hearing was either inadequate or just plain wrong. So for example, when you ask most Americans what sprawl is and what the problems are, the first thing that comes to mind for many people is they say, well, sprawl means people are moving further and further out from the center. That means that there's longer commutes, uh, more traffic, more congestion, and therefore more pollution. Right? That's something that you almost always hear when, you know, when people talk about sprawl. But even a few minutes reflection shows you that a very sprawled out city, like Kansas City, or Cleveland for that matter, um, Kansas City population density about 2,000 people per square mile in the urbanized area, if what the anti-sprawl people said were right, it would be really hard to get around Kansas City. But in fact, the average commuting time in Kansas City is 20 minutes. It's one of the shortest anywhere in the Western world. Here I'm showing a, an image, um, a typical image during the day in Kansas City. This is what it looks like most times in, in, on the freeways of Kansas City. If the anti-sprawl people were right, on the other end of the scale, a very dense, very compact city with arguably the best transportation, public transportation system in the world, and I'm talking about Tokyo, it should be a snap to get around, right? Well, if any of you have been to Tokyo, you know that much of the day it looks like that. The average commuting time in Tokyo is over 46 minutes, and something like 70% of all the people in the Tokyo region spend more than one hour each way getting to and from work. So um, this isn't the, the whole story here, but it was enough to tell me that something was drastically wrong with the picture that um, was usually painted. So as I say, in the 1990s, um, this um, consensus seemed to form that economically, socially, environmentally, aesthetically, sprawl was bad and it had to be stopped. In fact, so unanimous was this consensus that I started to get very suspicious about it. Um, so unanimous it was that you could even see it, uh, this whole litany, in the pages of an airline magazine, the last people in the world who were about to try to antagonize anyone. So um, I decided to do a book in three parts. First part is a history of sprawl itself. Then I did a history of complaints about sprawl. And finally, a history of remedies. So let's um, take a look. 
First of all, as I got started, the accepted wisdom was that sprawl was recent. Most people thought it was after World War II. They thought it was peculiarly American somehow, and they thought it was caused by the automobile. Actually, though, I think that if you take a, a much broader view, you find that none of these things are really true. So for example, if you look at this picture of 19th century Paris, this was taken by a photographer who was nostalgic already for medieval Paris that was about to be wiped out by Baron Haussmann in the mid-19th century. And we can look at this with a little bit of nostalgia, but if you lived on the ground floor of this building, not only was this going to be unpleasant and malodorous, but it was downright unhealthy. You would have had a life expectancy years shorter than someplace on the periphery with more light, more air, and where epidemics wouldn't come racing through the very dense um, population. So for this reason, from the beginning of time, as far back as we can trace cities, until very recently, the great urban evil was too much density. And whenever a new group of people was able to afford to move out, they did. And that seems to be the history of sprawl um, all the way from the beginning of time until fairly recently. So I don't know much about sprawl in Babylon. We do know that it existed. But in the Roman times, we know, very, uh, we know a great deal about sprawl. After all, the Romans were the ones that gave us our term suburbia, sub and urb, below or beneath the walls. And um, here's a good example of where a wealthy uh, family from Naples might have spent weekends or summers or even much of the year in a love, luxurious villa like the one you see here. If you had enough money and power, if you were the Emperor Hadrian, you wouldn't stop at that. You would get yourself hundreds of acres out in the beautiful green hills east of Rome. And I call this area beyond the regularly developed suburbs, I'll call this exurbia. And this story seems to be as old as cities and as old as sprawl as well. Every time you have an economic growth and a new class of affluent citizens, sprawl seems to accelerate. So in London in the 19th century, you had the largest and the most affluent city in the Western world. Not surprising that it absolutely explodes outward into places like this, mile after mile of these little brick row houses. Now, for the people who moved there, this was nearly paradise. They'd had none of that squalor and congestion and noise of the central city. They had, by comparison, a very low-density, green place to live. For the artistic and intellectual elite of the day, however, this was a nightmare. This was ruining the beautiful British countryside. These were ugly, monotonous boxes put up by speculators, greedy to get the last penny out of every square inch of land. They were confident that this was going to be a slum in one generation. Now, the thing that made this possible wasn't the automobile. It was the train. And here again, we find people like the Duke of Wellington telling us that the train is actually a really bad invention. It just allows the common people to move around needlessly. Now, interestingly enough, even though the complaints about sprawl here are virtually the same kinds of complaints that we would see in every generation afterward, we find something interesting happening, which is one generation later, when these were supposed to become a slum, in fact, the, the same artistic intellectual elite decided, no, this isn't a slum at all. This is actually the essence of central London. This is what has to be preserved at all cost from that nasty sprawl that's now going on at the periphery. Now, the way I've found to um, visualize this best is something called the density gradient. In this kind of chart, if you take the, the horizontal axis, that's the number of miles from the city center. The vertical axis is the number of people per square mile. What this chart shows you is in 1800 in London, there were more than 100,000 people per square mile at the center. Now, these are densities that we can hardly imagine. Uh, as we'll come back a little later, um, Cleveland uh, urbanized area is um, 2,800 people per square mile. So very, very dense at the center, but then the density drops off dramatically, so that by the time you get eight miles out, you're at nearly agricultural densities. Over the decades, what happens here is that every decade, you have more people moving out from the center, moving out to the periphery, and the result is that the density gradient flattens and it lowers. 
And what's interesting about this is that this isn't just London. This appears to be every city anywhere in the world where there is any measure of freedom of choice for the population to move where they want to or any kind of land operating land market. In fact, it's true for every city I can find up until very recently when something else has happened, which we'll come back to just a little bit. Now, one of the strangest things, one of the most unexpected things, was something else. And that was that rather than killing the central city, it appears that the flip side of the coin of sprawl at the edge was gentrification at the center. So in Paris, that scene that we saw, it's bulldozed by Baron Haussmann. In its place, these magnificent boulevards with mostly upper middle class people living in them. This is possible because the poor people and the industry that was in place either had enough money to move out or in this case was forced out. That left a vacuum for something else to happen. So this seems to be a recurrent theme. Fast forward a little to the, the era between the wars. Now, London, again, uh, is probably the fastest um, dispersing city in the, in the Western world. Um, here you see central London just going out like shotguns um, uh, scattered out into the periphery. Between the wars, Greater London grows in population less than 10%. The built-up area more than doubles. This is sprawl on a scale that has never been surpassed anywhere in the United States since World War II. And here's, the way, uh, here's what people lived in. Again, um, this was very much criticized very heavily by an artistic and intellectual elite. Over in the United States, same thing is happening, but instead of those semi-detached houses, we typically have um, single-family uh, bungalows like you see outside Chicago. Or we continue to have exurbia, and I'm using a, um, a really spectacular Cleveland case, um, Gates Mills, which um, is a, a place that's inhabited by urbanites, but with every intent to try to make this look like a rural village. The other thing that happens in exurbia is that you have people at the top of the um, socioeconomic spectrum and at the bottom because exurbia also provided a lot of cheap land, for example, for African Americans. And so you have um, through the, the region, although the, the biggest group of them is in the east side of central Cleveland, you also see these outposts like Chagrin Falls Park, um, a largely self-built African American community very far out into the exurban uh, periphery. Now for a few minutes after World War II, there was a big switch. Um, the Europe had been following exactly in the same pattern as the US. Right after World War II, Europe is on its knees economically. It needs to do something very fast to get a lot of housing. European governments typically put a lot of power into the central government and into the hands of public planners. And for a couple decades, they built um, a lot of housing like the, what you see here on the, on the left. Um, that is these large concrete barracks-like buildings, both uh, east and west of the, of the, of the wall. And um, this worked. It did, in fact, provide a lot of housing very quickly. But with, within one generation, when Europeans got back on their feet economically, middle-class Europeans no longer wanted to live in places like this. Now, the result has been, if you've watched the stories of the violence around central Paris, for example, in the Parisian suburbs, it's almost always in places like this. This has become the housing of last resort for immigrants and minority groups all across Western Europe. The typical Parisian today lives in the kind of um, landscape that you see on the right-hand side there, single-family houses, row houses. Typically, they get around, do almost all of their um, daily transportation needs by automobile. And you can see this just statistically. People say, oh, European suburbs are very different, or European cities very different than American cities. We use the automobile so much more. Well, it is true. At any given moment, we have a lot more automobiles per capita. We use them more. But if you look at the trajectory, you find it's almost exactly the same. It's a little bit like comparing, comparing a five-year-old and a 25-year-old. In fact, if you um, look at this, you see that not only is the trajectory largely the same, but with a time lag, 
and that time lag is largely due to the amount of affluence. But you see that because in the United States we're almost saturated the market, we have almost one car for every registered driver in this country, our market is saturated, whereas in Europe they're continuing to buy, and this is despite the most incredible taxes on gasoline, on new cars, every imaginable um, try, uh, attempt to discourage people, nevertheless, automobile ownership, automobile use are rising much faster in Europe than here. Or let's look at it from a different way. Ridership in trains, in buses, since World War II has been almost flat, despite billions of dollars of investment, whereas the use of automobiles, the use of airplanes has been a very steep upward trajectory. This brings us to where most people think the story of sprawl starts. In many ways, we can say this is where it ends. That is, we've been seeing increasing decentralization in American cities up to the 1950s. In the 1950s, we reach the largest lot size that had ever been seen in urban um, areas anywhere in the world, that is a quarter acre. And it's the largest lot size on average we ever would see because lot sizes are not getting larger in American cities and suburbs. If you go to the periphery of most American cities today, you find that the last suburban subdivision is actually much tighter. Lot sizes have declined rather dramatically in the 90s and early years of the 21st century. But it's done this in an uh, uneven way. So Chicago is typical. Chicago, like Cleveland, like Paris, like London, has seen a continuous decline in the population density of urban, its urbanized area. It's gone from 7,000 people down to something like 4,000 people and, and is probably stabilized at that point, but it might still be falling a little bit. The fastest growing cities in the southeast, southwest of the United States, on the other hand, they were rather low in density to begin with. Those, for some reason, and I don't think anyone knows why, have started to become much denser. So Los Angeles, which was always the poster child for sprawl, has gone from 4,000 people up to above 7,000 people, making it currently the densest urbanized area in North America. Now, urbanized area is central city and all the um, urban area around it above 1,000 people per square mile. It's the Census Bureau's only functional definition of a city. And you look at that view, and you can see why with Los Angeles. Even though there's nothing even remotely like the densities of Manhattan, it's like this, which is at relatively high densities, particularly when in most of these little single-family houses, you have, um, in, in ethnic neighborhoods particularly, you have a lot of people per house. And it goes on like this all the way to the edge, and then it stops. There's almost no real exurbia in Los Angeles. Now, if you look at this worldwide and you take all the affluent cities in the world, you find very much the same pattern. That is, dramatic drop in density of the oldest, largest cities. And if you couple that with this rise in density of the least dense, fastest growing cities, you find that it's all converging between about 5,000 and 15,000 people per square mile. Now, my, I don't know why this is happening exactly. My guess is that it may be that at those densities, you can have all of the advantages of the dense 19th century industrial city, but you can still use the automobile for almost all of your daily needs if you want to. So looking at it a different way, if we look at the chart of the densest cities in the world, we find that the first two or 300 of them are the poorest, among the poorest cities of the world. Only one exception and that's Hong Kong. And we can come back to that at, um, at the very end, but you have to get down to number 300, 400 to get to the European cities, and then finally at the very bottom, um, the American cities. Now, the current situation is that we have in the central cities a rather remarkable rebound, and this is all across the Western world, um, you see it, you saw it already in, in 19th century Paris. You see it strongly in San Francisco since World War II. And you even see it in some of the most um, um, bombed out looking places in the United States. The South Bronx, while people weren't looking at it, has been largely rebuilt. 
in Chicago, where I live, some of the hardest, most desperate neighborhoods are coming back extremely strongly. Um, suburbs um, continue to be built, but at slightly higher densities in the US. One of the interesting things is that with the decline of density of European cities and the rise of density in American suburbs, when you look at a place like Phoenix, and then you compare it with, oh, I'm sorry, our legends are off there, compare it to outside Munich, um, you realize something interesting, which is that the actual gross density, that is the overall density, is about the same. Now, granted, these look very different, but actually, functionally, in terms of how people get around, what they do day to day, these are really very similar places. And finally, the exurbia. And um, here I'm showing a couple examples. Um, these McMansions near Rootstown, you're, you're driving south of I-76 and you're out in the middle of what you think is absolutely the middle of the countryside and you suddenly come across these, these gigantic houses and you don't even know, where are these people working? Where do they, what do they do? Do they drive into Cleveland? More likely they're going into Akron or to Youngstown or Canton. Um, but this is spreading across a lot of countryside, particularly in a place like Northeast Ohio. Um, but it's uh, not just here. Here's some example outside San Francisco. Um, mostly urbanites, but trying to make it look very rural. And the, almost the entire French Riviera has become a landscape like this. You can see this exurban tissue very clearly in this shot. The, the darker color is the, is the high density. Um, this is mostly 19th century cities. And then it's in this incredible tissue of exurban uh, which you see just engulfs the area around the Great Lakes and the eastern seaboard. The result of this has been a remarkable convergence. All across the world, middle class people seem to want similar things, or at least they have wanted several things. So you see, for example, the single family house showing up, um, whether you're in um, um, Germany here or in Australia, in Russia or China, even before there's an operating land market, you have the same preferences for single family houses on their own plot of land. In fact, every survey I've ever seen, no matter where in the world, the majority of people have said they would prefer a single family house on its own piece of land to any other arrangement. I have never, ever seen a survey where even 25% say they want to live in tall apartment buildings, for example. And it's gotten to the point where you're, you're very hard pressed to know when you're coming into an airport, what city are you in? Which one of these is Boston? Which one is Bangkok? And I think maybe if you look at it long enough, you can determine some pattern of vegetation on the ground, but it's probably the only thing that will um, tip you off. Complaints about sprawl. The term sprawl as a noun, meaning its current meaning, is not an American invention, it's British. It comes into common use right after World War I. During the interwar period, British intellectuals, architects, planners are just horrified by the garden city suburbs, as you see on the bottom there. But even more than that, what really gets their goat is things like the thing you see on the top, Peace Haven. Peace Haven was a working class um, resort community that was self-built on the British Channel. And um, British architects and planners just went ballistic when they saw this. And this has been true from the very beginning. Sprawl is rarely ever where affluent, tasteful people live, no matter how low density, but it is almost always where people with a not so good taste and usually a minimum of, of income live. The second generation of complaints comes in the United States after World War II, and they're on all of the grounds that we talked about. They're on the grounds of, um, of economic um, uh, efficiency, and the great rock, the statistical rock that this is built on is these, this great study of the costs of sprawl. Um, unfortunately, very statistically um, unfortunate, and we can talk about that if you want later. Um, there's social complaints, there's uh, beginning to be quite a bit of environmental complaining about sprawl. And then finally, the, the aesthetic objections, which, by the way, have always been the loudest and the most persistent. And then finally, the third generation 
since the 1990s and um, all of the same complaints. Now um, it's been the environmental has moved up to first place, but the um, rhetoric has now get ratcheted up. So we have these books like Road to Ruin and, and Sprawl Kills. Now I don't have time to go into all of these um, allegations about sprawl. I can say generally that I think that if you look at really carefully at any one of them, they are much, much less solid than they seem. Now, some things seem to be directly connected to sprawl and are real problems, like species habitat. Other things, like global warming, which is currently the, perhaps the most alarming thing that's been laid at sprawl's doorstep, I don't think you can really blame sprawl for that. And let's look at this in two ways. Okay, the first way is, let's say for a moment that everyone in the urban world lived in a small Parisian apartment and took public transportation anywhere. Would this solve our global warming problem? No, not at all. It would, if we brought everyone up to middle class standards, and that means all those people in the developing world, and they all lived the way that Parisian apartment dweller lives, we'd have much more um, greenhouse emissions and global warming than we do now. That's because so much of the world currently is so poor that it can't afford carbon fuels to begin with. So unless we want to keep a lot of the world in abject poverty, this is not the solution to push people around on the landscape to make it perhaps more efficient. But it's even a question whether it really is more efficient. Because if you think about it for a moment, you realize that at, let's say, one house per acre, if it was sprawled all across our country, and there's, by the way, there's plenty of room for that. We could fit the entire urban population, or the entire population of America into the state of Wisconsin at suburban densities. So let's say we really dispersed everyone, what would happen? Well, at that kind of density, almost everybody could get all the energy they needed right on site through solar, wind, biomass, uh, geothermal. Uh, there's no particular reason to think that in the post-industrial city, that being close together in the city and having very few people in the countryside is any more sustainable than having people very widely dispersed. Okay, three, remedies for sprawl. Now, let's say for a moment that I'm entirely wrong. Sprawl is terrible and we want to stop it. Could we? What has happened when we've tried? Now, one of the curiosities of sprawl, and it seems to be a topic that's just shot through with these ironies, is that the remedies for sprawl seem to be largely based on the remedies for too much density. So the primary, most important remedy for sprawl in the English-speaking world has been things like this. This is Ebenezer Howard's idea of the garden city. For Ebenezer Howard, the city, the dense city like London, was a killer. He wanted that to wither away. He wanted to get rid of the private market and land. He wanted to create these little dispersed settlements. And his idea was that you would get a settlement of maybe 35 to 50,000 people with a garden in the center and then rows of housing and industry. When it filled up, there was a green belt. You couldn't build on it. You had to go jump over to another place and then you connected all of these garden cities by a railroad. And so you see the, the diagram on the, on the left-hand side there. And for him, that was going to produce the best of the city and the countryside, but merged together. So that diagram, you take a look at that for a moment, and then consider how it affected this. This is that planner we looked at in Between the Wars, Sir Patrick Abercrombie. He did the most famous um, anti-sprawl plan of all time. This is the Greater London Plan of 1944. The idea here is that London would indeed decentralize, it would sprawl, but only to the edge of that violet area. Beyond that, there would be a green belt where you couldn't build, and then if by chance there was any excess population, it would go into discrete small garden cities that were dotted around in the countryside. Did it work? Well, the green belt's still there. It's an aesthetic triumph. Americans, when they go to London, are absolutely astonished to drive on the London Orbital Highway through the middle of that green belt and just see fields. Now, of course, they know that there's development on both sides. They can, readily, they can readily test that by the fact that they're stopped absolutely dead in traffic. But aesthetically, it's a great um, virtue to have that green belt. Did it stop sprawl? 
Well, hardly. Um, Londoners became much more affluent than Abercrombie expected. They were more numerous than he expected. Um, and so rather than the Greenbelt stopping the, the outward sprawl of London, it just poured out over this Greenbelt. The British government, in able to make this work, did the draconian step of nationalizing all development rights by compulsory purchase in 1949. So that when those people did jump over the green belt, it was often very difficult and time consuming to get housing. So the result has been, not only are these some of the highest housing prices in Europe, but the commute is probably much longer and therefore the traffic much worse than it would have been if there hadn't been any green belt at all. Now despite this, and all of this was well known by the 1970s when reports of this came out, American cities, for American cities, this is the holy grail. Here's the most famous American city example, Portland, Oregon, where they've tried to do the same thing. Now the, the green belt here moves outward as demand requires, but most of the same things are in place. They've spent billions of dollars on public transportation and tried to stop highway building. Has it worked? Well, once again, the fastest growing parts of the Portland, Oregon area are not within the growth belt. There are little towns around it, and even faster growing is Vancouver, Washington, across the Columbia River, where they don't have these kind of green belts. That attempt to stop automobile traffic and to boost public transportation, has it worked? Well, no. Um, Portland has very low um, transit use, like all American cities, um, and that transit use is still falling, whereas the highway congestion is growing faster in Portland than in any city its size in America. And it's also had the same effect on housing prices, because every time you restrain the supply of housing, it's going to affect prices. So we have one of the fastest rising housing prices in the, in the country. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing for Portland, or for London for that matter, but it is to say that, to be honest here, we have to realize that these choices come with consequences. Now, I don't want to leave you with the idea that we can't stop sprawl. That's not true. We can. Here's a place they did it. Uh, this is um, St. Petersburg. Um, the Soviets were very good about stopping sprawl. Uh, in the case of Moscow and St. Petersburg, they tended to restore the center, um, put in uh, new classical buildings four or five stories high. Beyond that, they built many, many of these great um, high-rise concrete buildings at a fairly high density. And then beyond that was this um, beautiful open green countryside, which even in the 1990s, um, when I took that picture, was still there. It was still available to people from um, St. Petersburg to go out for their dashas and for recreation. Um, in fact, and I'm not belittling this at all. In fact, if you look at, at the Soviet Union in the 1950s, in the 30s, or right after World War II, it was a desperate economic situation. The fact that they were able to create good sanitary housing for all their citizens in a transportation system that got them from houses to jobs was remarkable. But it came at a price. And that price, in this case, was obviously individual freedom to move where you wanted to move, to work where you wanted to work. Here's another example where they stopped sprawl. We mentioned this earlier in Hong Kong. They did stop sprawl here. Now, unlike Britain, which after all is still a democracy, um, Hong Kong really wasn't. The British system there had a governor with uh, massive power. He was able to impose a regime in which they did not allow for a sprawl. Um, the, there was a lot, of, there was population growth, but it, when it went outside of Hong Kong proper, it only was allowed to go into very small, con, um, confined new towns, and they looked much like you see at the top there. They are even higher density than most of the existing um, area of Hong Kong. So you have a density here that is 40 times the density of the um, Cleveland area, and much higher, it's, it's like four times higher than, than London or any other western um, city. And the result here is that the average person in Hong, and, and most of the rest of it is left green. Not even agriculture, it's mostly very hilly and it's national park. So the result here is that the average unit in Hong Kong is in a 20-story building about 20 years old. It's about 500 square feet. And by the way, the Hong Kong families are, are quite a bit bigger than ours. And the average price of these is $300,000 to $500,000 US. 
we've stopped sprawl in the U.S. Here's Nantucket Island. Now, Nantucket Island is, if, if any of you have been there, you know this is a very beautiful place, so it makes a lot of sense to have conservation, preservation easements, public and, and private purchase of open space. Um, all of these together have meant that it's very difficult to build anywhere in Nantucket. There's still a few subdivisions, but when they're built out, that's probably the last that will ever be built there under the current regulations. And the result, well, you can see for yourself, it's beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful places in the U.S. But again, it came at a price. Here, the average cost of a house went over a million dollars already in the 1980s. Now, what this means is that most of the people who work in Nantucket can't afford to live there. They have to take an expensive, time-consuming ferry from um, the mainland. Is this good? Is it right? Is it fair? Well, I think most Americans would say in this case, it is so unique, it is so beautiful, that it's probably worth preserving at almost any cost. But would you say the same thing if this were the city of Boston or this were the Northeast Ohio? Now, one of the things that's become very clear recently has been this affordability crisis. Um, and if you look at the figures, you find something really remarkable. If you track the ratio between the average house price, the median house price, excuse me, and median income, you find that places that have a lot of regulation, a London or the West Coast of the United States, have ratios that are apparently unprecedented in modern history. It appears that the average ratio was three to four times. But we see in places like London or Los Angeles these astronomical ratios. It doesn't have to be that way. If you look at some of the most affordable places in the affluent world, you find they are places, and now some of these are clearly affordable because there's very little economy to support it. Um, but when you see in that column places like Atlanta or Dallas-Fort Worth, Austin, Texas, you realize that it can't be entirely laid to the performance of the economy. This regulatory regime must be playing some significant part. Okay, conclusions. Um, my conclusion isn't that sprawl is either good or bad. I'm taking it as just a neutral phenomenon. I'm interested in who's benefited, who's lost, at what cost. I do think it's a terrible diagnostic tool. It lumps together real problems directly caused by sprawl, like loss of species habitat, species extinction, with problems that are only tangentially related, like global warming, with some things that I think are really um, pretty silly. I think the idea that sprawl or suburbs causes obesity, just on a statistical basis, this is a very poor argument. And, um, and just logic would tell you that it's eating too much and not exercising enough and not because you um, live in suburbia that causes that. The second is I think it distracts us from real urban problems. What do I mean by a real urban problem? By a real urban problem, I mean that one third of the world's urban population that lives on less than a dollar a day, where people are dying by the tens of thousands for lack of clean water and sanitary sewers. And finally, for me, as an observer of the built environment, I think that it very tragically distracts our view from these places where most of us live, uh, most of us in the United States, not necessarily the folks in this room. Um, this is a typical piece of sprawl. This is northwest of Boston. Most people don't even bother looking out the plane window when they're going over this. They start to look when they get down to central Boston. But I think that this landscape is as rich, as varied, its history has been as interesting, and its future certainly as interesting as any other part of the built environment. I think that even if we think this is a bad idea, and we have no idea how this is going to transform itself over the next 50 years, even if it's a bad idea, we at least have the obligation to understand a little bit how it got that way, how it's been beneficial for so many people before we try to change it all. Okay, just a couple words about uh, Northeast Ohio. I think that every satellite view immediately confirms the fact that Cleveland is part of a great system of cities. 
And so when you look at that sprawl, you can see that indeed, um, and the, the purple here is the urban area, you can see that yes, the, the, the most, the densest population is right there in Cleveland proper, but it, um, it, it explodes outward into all of these um, surrounding suburbs and then the um, industrial satellite cities. A lot of people, one of the typical responses to um, the Northeast Ohio is that this is an area that has not grown in population, and yet it's sprawled as much as almost any area in the country. And a lot of people say this has to be bad, and this has to be wasteful. And they very often make the assumption that that's what's hurting central Cleveland. And to change that, you would be able to solve the problems of central Cleveland. Well, I think what this history shows us is that this is not um, the cause of the problems of central Cleveland are not sprawl. They may have exacerbated some of those problems, but there were problems with central Cleveland very readily, avail um, uh, readily observable in the 20s and 30s and people very worried about it um, much before this great dispersion of the 1950s and 60s. And I think you can also say that trying to keep everybody pent up in the, the existing area is not going to help solve the problems of central Cleveland. After all, the places that have had the strongest rebound in the central cities, places like Paris or San Francisco, have seen sprawl continue unabated. In San Francisco, in fact, it, because they protect so much the existing community, the sprawl has now leaped over into the Central Valley of California. I think that you have to think of the um, Northeast Ohio in the larger context. It's like all of the cities of its kind, meaning, first of all, it's very much like Buffalo and Detroit and Rochester and Chicago and Milwaukee, that is, Great Lake cities, great industrial late 19th century cities. And it's very much like industrial cities everywhere else in the world, particularly places like uh, the industrial cities of, of Britain and of Europe. If you want to see uh, a European city, people think European cities are, are just all very wonderful and great vital urban centers. Well, that's true if you go to Paris and you go to some of the great capitals. But take a trip to Charleroi sometime if you want to see a city with some real problems. And the other thing to remember is that if you are looking at problems in the Cleveland and Northeast Ohio area, Cleveland isn't really the place with the greatest problems. Many of the greatest problems are in isolated pockets and places like Youngstown. Youngstown, in every way, has had more problems than Cleveland and has also has fewer resources. Cleveland, after all, is extremely rich in its um, institutions and all sorts of positive things that um, Youngstown can't claim. Now, a lot of people think that sprawl will just continue. Um, this is a projection um, from, a, from a website that uh, David Beach has put together, and it shows that um, Cleveland has indeed sprawled prodigiously. But a couple things you can say about this. One is that sprawl may not continue like this. If suburbs are becoming denser, this may not come to pass, first of all. Secondly, if it did come to pass, is it really sprawl given that what actually seems to be happening by 2020 in this projection is that it's infilling, like between Akron and Canton and Akron and, and Cleveland. This may be actually consolidation. And then the third thing to say is, would it be bad if it did happen this way? And there I don't think that um, anybody um, necessarily knows. I think that what you can say is that the great um, assets that Cleveland had are assets that it still has. That is, you look at this map again, you realize that Cleveland is very centrally located in one of the largest collections of people anywhere in the affluent world. And, and it's right on a, a great lake, which provides um, a very ample source of water. It has a relatively mild climate and a, and a genial um, topo topography. Um, and it also has a tremendous investment in institutions and in um, um, human capital, and most important, today it's one of the most affordable places in the United States. All of these things, I think, suggest very strongly that this is a place that um, could indeed be very competitive in the future. Um, houses like some of the ones you're seeing here can be bought in the Cleveland 
uh, Northeast Ohio area for less than you would pay for a tiny little house in Los Angeles. That probably will not last indefinitely as people get tired of paying those prices. The other thing to, to be aware of is, as I've said, if you look at the trajectory of cities like Cleveland, and the one that's actually closest that, uh, that comes to mind that gives a good indication of what might happen, I think, is Chicago. When I came to Chicago in 1978, it was really in bad shape. And I don't think you could find five people who would have told you that you were about to see in the next 25 years one of the most vigorous revitalizations, one of the most amazing um, rebuildings of a central city anywhere in the Western world. But it's happened. And I think that we are probably on the same track in Cleveland. Now, that brings up the point, what should you do about it? Is there something a government should do? Well, I'm a little skeptical about most of the usual fixes. I don't think that you should be throwing around tax abatements, and I don't think that policies to attract the creative class are probably going to be the answer. I think that the, the better answer is that what government should do is what government really needs to do and ought to do, which is all the basic services. Fix the roads, fix the potholes, get the schools as, as, um, as good as you can, um, and invest in infrastructure. Then then when opportunity knocks, you'll be ready to run with it. So I think that um, I don't have the formula for how to do this, but my guess is that unless the opportunity is squandered, um, Northeast Ohio and Cleveland, because of this tremendous investment and assets, are um, in a very, very good position to um, do some remarkable things in the 21st century. Thank you very much. time for questions and you can see we have two mics set up here so if you wouldn't mind queuing up and um, I'm, we have some time so please yes, lifetime I can expect to see great changes um, yes I think you're starting to see them already um, the um, if I I I should have, I had another slide I was going to show. I, I showed, I think, in one of the previous slides by the Outhwaite homes, this, this area that looked like it was pretty well decimated. But in fact, through much of central Cleveland, you're already seeing some of that rebuilding. Land prices are going up. I think it's, it's slow to see the results, but I think it's already happening. And you just have to look carefully to see the signs. Sprawl is one you didn't mention, which is the loss of agricultural land, particularly mm -hmm. in the Northeast U.S., which is good at land, which doesn't usually need irrigating. I wonder if you address that. Um, what you see worldwide has been that um, we are worldwide we're using less land for agriculture and we're getting a greater input, uh, we're getting a greater output. That is, agricultural production is rising all over the world. In the United States, we have vastly more food. We're making vastly more food than we really need, and it's subsidized. Last year, something like half of all farm income came from government. Also, you have to realize that if you're talking about most of the area around Cleveland, that farmland is hardly environmentally neutral. Um, this is a situation where you've taken land, you've stripped off the ground cover, you plant it with a monoculture, douse it with chemicals. This is a, it's a, it's a problem. Um, actually, in many cases, to make it into low-density suburbia or exurbia, it's actually environmentally better. So I, I don't think, maybe in the far future, there will be a problem. Maybe we'll need more agriculture. But I don't think that's something that is a real problem anytime soon. In your book, you go through and uh, dispense with a number of causes of sprawl, uh, including racial dis discrimination in general and redlining in particular. And I wonder if you'd care to comment on how you see that uh, functioning in either Chicago or the Cleveland area. Okay, good question. I don't discount race as a factor. Race has obviously been a, a huge factor in every American city, and there's no doubt that a lot of people have moved out from neighborhoods when they start to see racial change. What I do say is that I don't think that you can use it to account for um, 
even most of sprawl, and for the simple reason that the, the decentralization of American cities has been the same whether you're talking about Cleveland with a very large minority population or you're talking about um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, or you're talking about any of the cities in Europe. So yes, indeed, r race plays a big part here, but I don't think it's a defining, overwhelming force. I was just wondering if you think that it would be a good idea for cities to merge with the county, like Cleveland, to just overtake Cuyahoga County and, and duplication of services like education, police, fire, and this sort of thing. Yeah, I don't think that um, one, I don't think that either big government or many little governments is, is necessarily better. I think this is a, a classic problem in, in democracy. On the one hand, um, getting a bigger government could provide some, um, some uh, efficiencies. On the other hand, uh, and some governments, like Minneapolis-St. Paul has regional government, seems to work really well. But I don't think anybody would really say that Miami-Dade has worked all that well. Um, Jane Jacobs, um, who's been much in the news lately, defined a region as that area sufficiently larger than the last area for which we could find no answers. And I think in many ways that may be the case. Our problems have to be solved. I think whether you've got big government or little government, um, you still have to solve those problems. Hi. Hey. Uh, I wanted to get your comment about the, uh, our sprawl is more, I think, um, the lack of connectedness between subdivisions and how this trend is different than the trend that you would see in London um, that you were mentioning as the um, beginning of sprawl. Does that make any sense? L less connected, uh, how? Well, they're more, they're just pockets of streets. They're cul-de-sac in nature. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that was the pattern in the 50s and 60s. Uh, increasingly, and particularly be the new urbanists have been um, trying to push the idea of connectedness and, and going back to the grid. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages of that. I think that we do have a problem with getting around, and particularly getting around by car, but the problem isn't the sprawl. Um, in fact, the, the biggest problems in the United States are places like Los Angeles, and the problem there is not sprawl, it's that it's gotten higher and higher in density, and they haven't built the road network that goes with it. Um, Cleveland is actually, in, in terms of roads, in very good shape. It may not seem that way to you when you're on a congested freeway, but um, your, your roadway system here is, is one of the more um, elaborate and um, efficient ones in the, in the country. Yeah, I just wanted uh, to know if you had any thoughts on the recent uh, foreclosure crisis that's been occurring in older industrial cities like Detroit, Buffalo, and Cleveland, and how that affects your rosy outlook for the central city in Cleveland, as, as you concluded with. Yeah. Uh, well, th this crisis has largely been a crisis of the subprime market, and it's largely a crisis that institutions were giving a lot more credit than they should. Now, um, in the end, what will happen is there will be an adjustment. Unfortunately for the people involved, it will be very unpleasant being pushed out of their house. In the long term, though, that doesn't really change much because remember that, that everything that happens that's negative for one group in society is usually an opportunity for somewhere else. Somebody's going to have to eat all those losses, but that's going to prove to have a, um, an effect for affordability that's, that's positive. One thing you can say, though, is that if this is a problem here, um, you can believe that if it really push comes to shove, it's going to be an even bigger problem in these places like um, Los Angeles or San Francisco, where the prices are just completely out of all sync with the, the general economy. Yes, sir. I'm not as sanguine about sprawl as you seem to be. Um, in fact, I'd say you sound like the uh, GM red car guy that wants to dismantle the, uh, the trolleys. Um, one of the inhumane things about sprawl is its effect on young people who can't drive, and you haven't addressed that. If you go to Munich, the young people can actually take the uh, rapid uh, trains and move around when they're five, four years old without their parents. What about sprawl in the United States in Burlington, Mass, where there's no sidewalks and the only transportation is in that vehicle? I think your, your uh, uh, portrayal that this is kind of a sanguine and it's just going to take place and it's the, uh, um, the proletarian path 
is, uh, is ignoring uh, the ability of humans to actually plan in a more sophisticated manner. And I'd like to uh, hear your response. Is there a better way to do it? Um, yeah, I think there are some better ways to do it. On the, the issue of the five and six year old um, going by public transportation, I think that even if we had a wonderful transportation system in Cleveland, very few parents would let their children go on transit at five or six. Um, but I think that the bigger issue here is that we have a problem with the car, and that is that there are a lot of people who don't own cars, don't want to use cars, and there's very little alternative. I think that here, this sprawl debate does us great harm because it's pitting automobile against public transportation as we used to know it. I think both of these are obsolete technologies, both the automobile and the bus and the train. Those buses and trains go around, many of them largely empty much of the day. I think that if we were to, to really start thinking of this afresh, we would think about how private transportation and public transportation can look more the same. That you would, maybe it's private, you'd have a pod in your closet, you get it out, you put, uh, you, you go 50 feet, you put 30 of them together and you go along a guideway at 200 miles an hour. Public transportation could be exactly the same thing, but um, it's something that comes to you because it's on demand. I think that, that the future, and, and you know, 50 years down the road, that we can probably solve a lot of these things. What I don't think we should do is to push our cities back into 19th century industrial state in order to make traditional big box public transit work. Uh, you spoke a little bit earlier about uh, Chicago, and I think that's a great comparison and a, a great opportunity if Cleveland can utilize its resources. And a question earlier asked about uh, regional government. Can you contrast Chicago, uh, Chicago's redevelopment with Cleveland, where Cleveland is kind of choked off by not just suburbs, but uh, uh, very close suburbs. We were recently ranked as one of the poorest cities, and yet you can walk to Shaker Heights or Cleveland Heights or a number of communities where those communities wouldn't exist but for their ability to work in Cleveland proper, and yet none of those tax benefits flow back. Right. Well, the situation in Chicago is actually very similar. That is, uh, in fact, we have more municipal jurisdictions than um, Cleveland area does. We have one of the largest in the country, and it's very acrimonious. Every Every day in the paper, you'll read the latest round between Mayor Daly and the, and the communities around the airports. So um, this isn't a good situation there either. But I think what happens is that if you don't think of this as a zero-sum game, if you think of the entire region as pulling together, it's, it's going to come up at the same time, almost certainly. And so I think that's what we're seeing in Chicago. The Chicago core is thriving at the same time that we're getting a lot of growth out beyond um, Tinley Park, for example. And it's all because the economy is coming back. The, the restructuring was really brutal in Chicago, just as it has been here and in Detroit. When that's done and the, the urban area finds a new niche, um, then I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back and it'll come back everywhere. Now, the idea about the, about the taxes, if in the city of, of Cleveland you can't redistribute income very well, it's unlikely to think that you're going to redistribute it from Brattonall back to, to Cleveland either. To this gentleman's commentary, personally, I was very intrigued with the ideas of the perspectives that you had on urban sprawl. I think we really need perspectives such as yours to build a better tomorrow. We need somebody with an open mind like you have. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs>